Today, when we think about television and computers, they're almost inherently linked. But back in the 90s, that wasn't the case until Gateway came out with their destination PC. Today, we're going to cover it right here on Vintage Geek. If you like what you see today, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps us a lot as we grow. And one thing that helps us the most is if you would consider becoming a Vintage Geek member. You can do that at VintageGeek.com and it's just under $20 a year. In other videos on the channel, we've talked about companies that tried to put the PC in the living room, most notably the IBM PC Junior. But the concept didn't really come to fruition until the 90s. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Gateway Computer brand, the company that infamously started making computers in a barn in South Dakota and then became the best-selling computer brand of all time at one point. It was a really interesting computer company and they put out a lot of interesting products, but none could compete, in my opinion, with the one we're going to cover today. What we have here is the Gateway Destination TV. Now, this is actually a later version in the series, but back in 1996, Gateway started making this particular product line. They envisioned having a PC in the home living room environment, and not just as a computer to the side, but actually as a component of your home entertainment system. They put a lot of capability into this particular computer. They have audio visual ins and outs, RF in and out. They wanted to make this like another component in your system, just like a VCR or maybe a video game console of the time. Gateway was successful in making a computer that could do this, but the first one they came out with was a little bit on the pricey side, coming in at just under $5,000 for those first models. And that package included a 31-inch CRT television, which is monstrous for CRT size. These machines eventually found their home in educational institutions. With the capabilities of a modern PC and the ability to show it on a large form factor television, it kind of made the perfect gateway, so to speak, <laughs> for them to get in on this technology and get it into the classroom. Now, the one we're looking at today actually came out in 1999, so this probably would have been one of the last models they made of this particular product line. I think you could actually get this system with a 27-inch monitor for just about $2,000, so a little bit more on the affordable side and certainly for schools around the country. The one we're looking at today definitely came from an educational environment. And the TV itself is absolutely monstrous, as I mentioned. Getting it here to our space for filming was basically impossible. But today we're going to do our testing with a standard VGA monitor. Because this machine actually has composite and S-video out, we can look at this directly in capture as it would have been shown on any standard television set. So I'm excited to take a look at that. Let's get into it here on Vintage Geek. Let's start by taking a look at the case of the machine, which is very large. There's probably a lot of room inside of this for add-on cards and extra modules, but just the physical form factor of this is much larger than most PCs we've covered here on the channel. Now on the front panel, we've got a couple of things going on, the floppy disk drive and the DVD-ROM. And that's actually worth noting because back in the 90s, especially in 1996, when the first model of this came out, that wasn't very common. Having that capability and being able to play DVDs on the device would have been a definite advantage for the time. We have the logoing on the front, which shows the Gateway Destination logo. The styling on the front is kind of interesting. You've got these little pegs that are sticking out in the bottom section near the AV inputs, which I should also mention are part of the many inputs and outputs on this device. You do have one set of composite AV inputs on the front as well as S-Video, and you've got a USB port and a microphone jack. So already quite a few things you can connect right to the front panel of this machine. The sticker on the front does indicate that this is a Celeron class machine. The first ones were the Pentium class, and this one had a little bit more processing power. You've got a power switch and a couple of LEDs, but not too much else to note on the front. So let's take a look at the back. Back. Starting to the left, we've got what looks like a standard ATX type power supply. But then as we move across the back panel, we see this is where things get very different. So we've got a number of different RCA connectors across the back panel. Of these connectors, we have a total of two audio video input sets. Those both include stereo audio as well as video connectors and S-Video. Then we have a full set of audio and video outputs. Just a single here, but it also has the composite video as well as the S-Video and your analog left and right audio outputs. And then there's a a secondary audio output as well. And I'm not sure if this one may be volume controlled by the computer. Probably won't know that until we really get into it a little bit further. There's also a digital audio output connector that has an adapter plugged into it that I did not remove because it seemed to be a little stuck. <laughs> it may be rusted in there, so I'm just going to leave that alone. Below that, we have all of the standard connectors for what looks to be a standard ATX type motherboard. But then in the expansion card area, we have another card that has an RF connector on it. And I believe that was actually to create an RF output 
output to feed to a television that may not have a composite input. Definitely a different panel than we've seen on any other computer. It's very complex looking for the time, and it looks like it's got a lot of capability. So I'm anxious to see what's inside. And as I suspected, there's lots of room for expansion inside this case. I did find it kind of fun that the quality seal was still intact on this device, so no one has actually been in the case as far as I can tell. And it does look pretty clean inside overall. It's worth noting that there are three five and a quarter inch slots on this machine that could accommodate drives. There is a DVD-ROM in one of those, but the other two are currently empty. There's a three and a half inch drive slot, which we covered when we looked at the front. And then there's a separate cage that can hold hard drives. There's only one installed currently, but it looks like it could accommodate more than one. Looking at the motherboard itself, it's an ATX style, as I anticipated. There are plenty of slots on this. We've got an AGP slot for graphics. We've got four PCI slots and two ISA slots. So lots of room for different expansion here. I think it's interesting that the video capabilities, well, I guess audio and video capabilities are being handled by ATI cards inside the unit. And it looks like there are two cards that are actually working in tandem. Those are connected with ribbon cables both to each other and to that back plane that has all of the audio video connectors on it. That was all probably custom for Gateway as they built this machine. And then they interfaced with ATI using their standard connectors to accommodate all of the various inputs and outputs. As far as RAM goes, there's only one RAM stick that's currently installed in this machine. Not sure how much memory that is, but there's, again, room for expansion. And you can see the Celeron processor heat sink assembly just behind that. Things are kind of what I expected when I got into the case, but I'm impressed with how much room there was to upgrade this thing over time. We've got the gateway destination set up, but of course the original setup of this would have included a lot more things that we don't have shown here today for various reasons. One, of course, is the original monitor, which was the giant CRT. We also have the original keyboard for this device, which was a wireless keyboard that actually used RF technology, not infrared. That particular keyboard may work, but the actual touchpad that's part of it is in pretty bad shape, and it definitely looks like someone left some batteries in it that may have corroded. Other accessories for the system included an IR transmitter, and I believe that was to control the physical monitor or television. Also, there is the remote control itself to, I believe, navigate through menus and actually do things within programs as well. We do have that, but it is missing the trackball, unfortunately. We're just going to use a standard IBM keyboard and mouse. And when we booted up the machine, we did get the initial stat screen that showed us some more details about the system. The machine has 32 megs of RAM. I'm guessing it could go up to a total of maybe 128 or 256. I'm not sure, but that would have been pretty powerful for the time. Now, this is the original hard drive for the system. It booted right into Windows 98 and actually had a network log on, which I had to cancel out of because I wouldn't have credentials for it. But thankfully, with Windows 98, I can still get in and see what's happening. And I was greeted right away with this wonderful cat background on the screen. Glad the cat was here to greet us as we uh, started up our gateway today. Looks like we've got some programs that came included with this. I see that there's some kind of a gradebook program here called Making the Grade. There's Exam View Pro. Teacher works. So that's all consistent with this being part of the educational environment. There's also a shortcut to an Algebra 1 test. I'm not really looking forward to taking that test, but uh, it might happen. First and foremost, though, I want to take a look at what's happening down here in the lower right hand tray because I see a number of icons that you wouldn't normally see. First, we have what looks like the display control panel. Now it shows that we're using 640 by 480 true color. 24 bit. That would be appropriate for using a television type monitor. As you can tell, the icons are bigger. That would work much better using an old CRT type display. Then we've got a Sound Blaster PCI 64 mixer. So this must have been integrated either into the motherboard or into the ATI cards that we mentioned earlier. I did not see specifically a Sound Blaster card in this device, but it looks like this mixer would control your various audio sources in the system. And this looks fairly advanced for the time. We've got line, aux, video. There's even a, an option for the modem volume control. You've got a recording level control, and it looks like you've got some uh, VU meters here. You've got mute buttons on each of the different channels, and it looks like with a couple of these for wave and synth, there's some additional options. There's a spatial option for wave, off, on, or wide. And you've got the same option for the synth, but with that one, you can also do reverb and chorus. Probably standard with the Sound Blaster 64. It's nice to see this all in one place here. And also in the tray, we've got our power indicator. Not sure why you would want to run this in anything other than always on mode. It's not like this device would run off of batteries. And if it did, <laughs> it would require a lot of batteries. But it does look like the power scheme is showing here, and I'm not quite sure why. Looks like they also had a version of Norton Antivirus Corporate Edition, probably part of whatever school system they were in. Then we have something called DestaView. Now, I think this might have to do with the infrared control, but I want to take a look at this. Start DestaView. 
what is this? Destination TV. So this actually is the gateway software, which is currently loading. The DestaView program appears to be for running TV RF through this box. In other words, it's used to control the TV just like it was a set-top box. Unfortunately, without having all the components in place, it's not really working as I would expect. We did get static on the screen, we got color bars on the capture output, but that was about it. So I'm just not familiar enough with how to use that to make it work properly, but it looks like an interesting piece of software nonetheless. Let's take a quick look at control panel to see what other hardware is showing in this machine. Looks like there's an entire setup for DestaView, which I'm not going to get into because last time I tried to open it, everything kind of crashed. So <laughs> I'm not going to go back into that one. Let's take a look at system. Definitely from a school district. We've confirmed that. And uh, it's showing a Pentium 2, even though it's a Celeron. 32 megs of RAM. Let's look at that device manager. And specifically, I want to take a look at the video side of things. So let's take a look at sound video and game controllers. Oh yeah, look at that list. All right, so we've got uh, ATI devices here. There's WDM video capture, TV tuner, TV audio, video audio crossbar, Cinemaster, whatever that is. Oh, that's probably for the DVD. Okay, that makes sense. There's a joystick port, a couple of codecs here with Wavetop and NABTS, and there's also an SP Audio PCI 64D legacy device. So just a ton of sound video and game controllers. We also can see the network adapter here. It's a 3Com, looks pretty standard, 10100 Ethernet port. Looks like it's got a dial-up adapter and a TV data adapter as well. That's probably for the infrared, not 100% sure. As always, I encourage you to sound off in the comments if you've used one of these, maybe you had one of these in the school you went to, would love to hear your stories. So let's get out of this and take a quick look at what other programs were installed on this machine. So it's got the full Microsoft suite, including Publisher, Word, PowerPoint, which makes sense. I'm sure for PowerPoint presentations, this would have been a very powerful system. We've got Expedia, ooh, Streets 98. I wonder if that requires the actual DVD-ROM or CD-ROM. Ah, oh, apparently we need the CD for that one. There's one called the Geometer Sketchpad, Dynamic Geometry for Windows. All right, so we got Draw Circle, Draw Segment, so you can select and translate things using the arrow. It's definitely more powerful than using like paint or something. I'm guessing this would have been for doing lessons on geometry. It looks like it's fairly powerful though. You could do quite a few things with it and it looks great on screen. I'm sure having this on the giant CRT monitor would be pretty impressive. Blenco Teacher Works. Lesson Planner, Teacher Resources, Correlations, Personal Assistant. This is the login box. Never seen a login box that's asked for all this information at one time. What is this, 10-step verification? Calendar start date, January 1st, 1990. Perfect. <laughs> oh, and here's all the holidays that are standard as no class days. I have no class every day. Looks like all the lessons are here. Collect and interpret data. Here's some board examples. Ah. Apparently we need the CD for that one. Let's try Exam View Pro since that's one of the desktop icons. Exam View Pro. Let's open an existing test. I don't have the energy to create an entire test from scratch today. <laughs> this definitely looks like it's geared toward paper. I wonder if the answer key is in here. Oh, edit. That's kind of cool. You could actually create your different answers and then you could scramble them. You can determine how many choices there are. Consult the YouTube algorithm. Close. This system, even though it was designed for presenting in the classroom, definitely looks like it was used by the teacher of the classroom as well. So basically it takes everything that you've created, sets of questions, and then it randomly puts them together to ensure that each test is unique. All of this looks like fairly powerful software. Overall, it looks like it was probably a solid system to use in the classroom. How could you have a machine like this in the classroom and not have some kind of a game that all the kids can play? You can play some Minesweeper. I don't remember how to play Minesweeper. So as I recall, the numbers in Minesweeper indicate, I believe, how many adjacent spaces have mines in them? Honestly, I don't remember. Oh, well, I just found the mine, so frowny face to me. Hey, it looks kind of like the Digitor. Start in the middle this time. Now, this one says three, so I assume that that means it's surrounded by mines? Nope, let's see. Try to avoid this, no. Nope. Should have known. <laughs> How does Minesweeper work again? I just got a quick refresher on Minesweeper and forgot about the right-click functionality, so let's try this again. All right, so this just has one adjacent to it. Okay, another one. And that one's got four. Stay away from that. This one's, ah, oh, dang it. <laughs> got a little overzealous there. Another one, and now we've cleared out some space. I assume that means the mine has to be here or here. I'm gonna assume it's here. Let me say that that's the case. And that this one is clean, which it is, great. So one of these has to be the mine. I'm guessing that's a mine. It's got two. Ah, <laughs> and I had one right. 
One of my flags was correct, but one of them was definitely wrong. Have to get back into Minesweeper, but just wanted to find one game to play on this uh, educational computer. So I'm happy with that and I'm gonna leave it there. The Gateway Destination TV. I'm pretty impressed with this device, especially with all the capabilities it had for the time. I would definitely say this was ahead of its time. The idea of having all of your TV functions going through a PC device was not common back then, but certainly has become way more of the norm today and we've got smart TVs everywhere. So I'm glad we have this in the collection and I'm glad that Vintage Geek is the final destination for this gateway. If you like what you saw today, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps us a lot. And the thing that helps us the most is when you become a Vintage Geek member. You can do that on the website and for under $20 a year, you get access to all of our content commercial free, plus a few bonus extras as well. It's at VintageGeek.com. Until next time, I'm Aaron and this has been Vintage Geek. Thank you.